Today we're going to have a, a look at um, an antenna modeling program with an unpronounceable name. Um, I'm still not sure how you're meant to pronounce this. I've been calling it Marnagal for the last five years, and it suddenly dawned on me that um, it's written by the same guy who wrote MMST, um, MMSSTV and uh, MMBARI. So whether we should call it MMANA, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, we're going to look at um, the antenna modeling software. We're going to look at how you can use it and we're going to look at some practical applications. It's not going to be an intensive, this is how you use a Marnagal or MMA and a gal, um, because it, it is quite complex. For that, there is actually a book, which I'm not here to promote, but it's published by RSD Beans, available on the book stand. You wrote it? Uh, I did write it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the story is, I gave this talk about two years ago, I think it was. As a result of that, Don Field said, could I write something for Practical Wireless? And RSGB read that and said, could you write a book? So that's how it came from. But anyway, what, how, where does this thing get this the daft name from? Well, it, it's a bunch of initials, really. The program was written by Makoto Mori, JE3HHT, which gives us the MM, which is where the MMSSTV and MM Vary comes from. Um, and then he added Antenna Analyzer, so that's the MMANA's part. Then it was further developed by two other uh, German hams, and he took the AL from Alex and the G from Goncharenko. So we've got MMANALG or MMANAGAL. So that's where the Darth name comes from. To this day, I don't actually know how you meant to pronounce it. But what is it and what can you do? Well, it's a free antenna modeling program that's based on the NEC NEC. Um, NEC2 engine. So it can do pretty much what you can do with EasyNEC. I'm not saying it's better than EasyNEC, I'm not saying, I think EasyNEC is, is probably better and more advanced, um, but it's free and you can play with it and see whether you like it or not, and that's, that's the good thing about this program. Um, the, the NEC engine was written at Lawrence Livermore Labs and was under contract to the US Navy. Um, and if you want to know what it's actually doing, it's solving um, it's breaking an antenna into small segments, solving Maxwell's equations for each segment and then summing them all together. That's all you need to know. Don't go any deeper than that. I, I, I did actually look at the equations and thought, right, okay, we'll, 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 we'll turn that down. Um, the limitation of um, the program is the, really, this is a the limitations. You can't really model coax. It can't model um, un, uh, buried radials. You need the NEC4 engine to do that. Um, it's, a, it's got a limitation on the number of segments. I've never hit that limit. I mean, you, you'd have to be designing parabolic dishes before you hit the, the limit, I think. But if you want something more powerful, there is um, a pro version, $99, that will handle more segments. And then, of course, we've got EasyNeg and EasyNeg Pro 5. Um, but I like it because it's free. We like that word, don't we, being radio hands. Oops. So what does it feature? Well, we can create um, multi-element designs. We can test the performance and matching. We can look at the um, predicted SWR patterns. We can look at the radiation patterns. We can even look at a 3D radiation pattern. And then we can automatically calculate what we would expect to see for the design in terms of its impedance, SWR gain, front to back elevation, and, and even the currents. And we can either do a straight SWR or we can do a, a, an R plus JX model um, so we can see the, the resistance and the uh, reactants. Um, we can generate data files, so you can actually generate an antenna and then run a whole SWR test from, from say 3 to 30 megahertz um, and then I put those and put that into a, a spreadsheet. So it's, it's quite a powerful program. The biggest thing I think I've heard people have said about the program is oh it's very good, I downloaded it, I fiddled with it, I didn't really understand it, couldn't really get to grips with it, which is, we'll try and help you with that today, because um, it's, it's a little bit tricky. What do we need to know to use it? We need to know a number of specific terms. Now, the antenna design that we make is made up of things called wires. No great surprise there. Um, straight wires. You can model curves. You can model things like magnetic loops by, by creating octagons, if you like. But everything is actually made up of straight wires. We can then include within that wire structure something called loads. Um, such as um, inductance or capacitance or traps and loading coils. So we have wires and loads. Once we've created our model with our wires and our loads, we then apply a source 
of a specific impedance at some point on one of those wires. And I like to think of the source as the feed point of the design. So you need to really understand three things, wires, loads, and sources. If you don't, if you don't get that, then you're, you're lost before you even start to try and make something. So as I said, straight wires, no curves. We can apply loads, i.e. inductances and capacitances, or, or combinations of the two. And then once we've made our design, we apply a source to some point on that structure, and then we can actually run it, we can pretend it's our antenna. If you get all this wrong, you soon know, because it says you have an SWR of about uh, 20,000 to 1 or something. Um, and that happens quite a lot. So how do we use it? This is the main um, program um, entry screen. And you'll notice that... Um, it has a number of rows, and each one of these rows is a piece of wire. So in this instance, if I just move the chair out of the way, you can see that we've actually got a length of wire here, which goes from minus 5.17 meters in the uh, y direction, minus y direction, to 5.17 meters in that direction. So you've got to try and imagine, sometimes it's a good idea to kind of sketch these things out, but what we've got is a piece of wire that is in fact uh, just over 10 metres long, okay, uh, of radius one millimetre, so we've got a piece of copper wire, and strangely you notice it's actually a 20 metre dipole, that's what we've actually built. So we've made a, a very, very simple antenna, ignore this for now, we're going to test it at 14.050 megahertz, as we like CW, um, and then so that's our wire. Now, what we need to do now, um, that's our wire. We're not going to mess around with any loads. We're not going to put any capacitors or, or um, uh, inductors in. But we need to apply our feed point. We need to apply our, our source. And our source is here. So we put, put one source in there. And it's, we look at this pulse. This is where it's actually going. And you see it says W1C. What this means is we will need to apply our feed point to wire one in the center. So we've got a piece of wire and we're going to break it in the middle and put our feed point in. There is another way you can do this. You don't have to um, put everything in as, as, as separate wires. You can actually kind of hand draw it on this uh, wire edit screen as well. And you'll, look, you'll see you've got all the X and Y coordinates here and the lengths. Um, this is quite handy if you're doing things like inverted Vs because otherwise you've got to start using Pythagoras to work out that where that point is and that point is. I mean, I've, I've kind of got used to doing it, but um, if, if you don't, you, and you need a 10 meter wire there, well, you need to work out with Pythagoras that, you know, if that was three meters there and four meters there, then that would be um, five meters along there. Um, but you can use this, you can actually just drag things out, and then it will take these measurements that you've created here and put them back into the, the, um, the wires um, uh, drop down menu that we saw earlier. So let's go back to our Dipole. So once we've created our dipole, we can then view it, and we go to the view mark, and you can see here we are. So we've got a dipole, and we've got our feed point in the middle. And I've actually run this, um, I've done a calculate on it before I've shown it to you. And you can see the current distribution. You can see the current distribution on the dipole. So typical dipole, maximum current in the center, zero current at the ends, the high voltage points. And what we can do with this view is we can actually rotate it um, around, we can zoom in on it. So you can actually have a look at your design and make sure you've got it right. But sometimes you might create something in the, in the geometry tab, and then when you actually look at it, you realize you made a complete mistake, you've got a wire going off here somewhere. Simple antennas like verticals, dipoles, um, two element beams, uh, quad loops are quite easy. Once you start talking about more complex antennas, such as stacked tri-banders or whatever, it, it, it turns into a mess if you're not careful. This way you've really got to keep a close note of what you're doing. When you've got a three-element tri-bander, stacked three-element tri-bander, so you now got one, two, three, four, five, six um, wires there, and you're trying to work out, well, which one do I put the, the source on, whatever, you know, you can get yourself very confused. So. Okay, so the third tab, you saw the first geometry was when we created the antenna, view was when we could have a look, make sure we've got it right. Now we go to the calculate um, tab, and a few things we need to know. So we're going to test it at 14.35 megahertz. Our ground, we have the options of free space, very useful if you're on the International Space Station, but otherwise useless. A perfect ground, good luck with that, um, and real ground. 
and I would suggest that you always make sure you're checking it um, against real ground and you can actually change the dielectric constant and um, resistance of your uh, wire conductivity, regular not resistance, conductivity in the ground setup. It comes with a standard setup for a, a typical suburban um, kind of backyard. Uh, but you could change that, you could change that to sea water if you want, you could change it. So I think it's, they, they talk about urban and suburban and uh, the usual um, setups. But for all intents and purposes, leave that alone for now. We can add, add height to it, so we're going to try it at 10 meters, and then material, we can select copper, we can select iron, we can select whatever we want, or this magical material called no loss. Um, so yeah, so if you get this wrong, I was talking to someone earlier, and, and he had accidentally tested his no loss antenna in free space, so I don't know what drugs he was on, but uh, <laughs> probably worked very well. So we've created the antenna, we've looked at it, we've now checked that we're going to test it at the correct frequency over real ground at 20 meters. I've deliberately left that at no loss to, to, to remind you that uh, you need to get that right. And we just press the start button and per chunk it comes out with one line. And this is, this is our result. So it says at 14.35 megahertz, we have an SWR 1.75 to 1 and a gain of 7.37 dBi. Now you're thinking, well hang on a minute, how do we get 7.3 dBi? This is the peak gain in some direction that we can now look at later. Actually, the, the peak at 14.6 degrees elevation. So this is a very, very quick check to make sure that we're, we're kind of ballpark and we're getting the SWR figures we want. You'll notice it says SWR 50. You can actually change this in the setup menu to whatever you want. So if you're creating um, off center fed dipoles where you're feeding them with a four to one balance, you could actually change this to 200 ohms to get, see the kind of SWR results that you would find um, if you were using a 4 to 1 balance. Um, another quick tip, you'll go, if you go to setup, there's a drop down menu where you select the um, impedance you want to test at, and you'll notice that 200 doesn't actually appear. I think it goes 50, 75, 150, 300, and you think, well, how do I do 200? Just type in 200, hit return, and it will take it. But it's not in the drop down. That confused me for a week or so and so I realized that. So again, when you're using this, it should default to 50 anyway, but if you want to do more complex things involving four to one, six to one, nine to one balance or islands, you can actually change it. So let's just recap. We've done a run, we hit start, and it says we're getting an SWR 1.75 to one. What we can now do is uh, have a look at the plots and it will show us um, the SWR plot of that particular antenna and we can have a look at it. We can see this is a typical SWR plot of a, a dipole. You'll also notice that um, on the kind of the test run or test area we want between about 14.35 and 13.95, that's about right. Ideally, we want that minimum to be about 14.175, but we can see that over the, the test range we, we're using, it's below two to one, and then it, it zooms up as we, we go off here. So you can actually um, then fine tune your antenna, make it slightly shorter, slightly longer to, to move the point where you want. <laughs> but a quick word of caution here. This is a model. This is not real life. This doesn't know that you've got a tree in your back garden, that you've got a greenhouse, that um, a, you, you're using 300 feet of coax. Um, a lot of people don't realize if you measure the your impedance, your, uh, the feed point of an antenna, and you'll probably you'll get an accurate result of what your um, impedance is. If you now add 300 foot of coax to it and measure it at the other end, you'll find it's an awful lot lower because of the losses in the coax. So this is assuming no losses in the coax. It's assuming you're, you're not using PVC coated wire. It will assume you're using just straightforward copper. Um, and obviously if you're using PVC, PVC coated wire with a slightly lower velocity factor, your antenna is now going to be too long. So there's, you've got to think of these things, but again, it's a model, and, and what I say to people is, is that, as far as I know, nobody's ever gained DXCC by using a Marmagal to contact people. Um, so it's a laboratory tool, if you like. It's a guide to the kind of things your antennas are doing. Um, but don't take it, uh, you know, um, as absolute gospel that what you see is what you're going to get when you actually build the thing. Now, we can then go to the fourth tab, which is far field plots, and we can actually see 
um, in uh, two dimensions what the, uh, the plot of the antenna is. So this is a simple dipole at 20 meters, mm -hmm. and you can see that it's actually breaking up into two lobes. So we've got a low angle lobe there at about, uh, it's just over 15, or, you know, 15 degrees, and we've got a high angle lobe as well. And what you can do is you can actually alter the height of your model to actually see what effect it has on these lobes. You'll be quite surprised. You can actually tune it to, to just get a single lobe or break out into multiple lobes. And you can see the classic dipole. Uh, the dipole would be running in that direction. So we're getting the radiation off the sides of the dipole as well. So again, very, very useful. Um, you'll also notice, you know I said about the maximum gain, it will automatically say where the maximum gain is. Um, and it's at 14.6 degrees here. Now we could actually save this plot and then compare it with another if we wanted. But what I would say is be very careful that you're always comparing like with like. So we actually have to test this at 14.6 degrees um, to actually, to actually make sure that we're actually looking at the, uh, the gain figures that's exactly the same on, on different antennas. Because you could run it again at a different height, this will change to some other measurement. So you, if you're trying to compare, you always want to make sure you're comparing at the same radiation angle. Um, okay. So that's a 2D plot. We can then click the 3D plot and we get that. Um, so you can see it in three dimensions. And we can actually rotate this and see where it goes. So a very powerful tool. So you, you think you put up a dipole and it's firing east-west and it's doing a lovely, lovely job. When in fact you, you now find that you've actually got um, kind of a null here. If you had anything coming in at this kind of angle, you know, you've got quite a null at that point. Uh, low angle it's working quite well, high angle it's working quite well, medium angle it's not working very well at all. And you find this with, with more complex antennas that you, you'll get lots of nulls. Um, and it suddenly, it suddenly explains sometimes why your antenna works better in some directions than others. So that's the 3D plot. Okay, so what I want to do now, and it's a very basic rundown of how you can use the program. What I want to do now is just look at some worked examples of how you might use this. And I thought we'd start off with a classic G5RV, which of course is a, a multi-band antenna. Or is it? Um, right, okay. Well, I thought what we'd do is we'd, we'd build a, a, a G5RV, we'd run it at 3.5, 7, 10, 14, 18, 21, 24, 28 megahertz and see what sort of results we get. So as you can see um, from this table here, I know you can't read it at the back, but I will go through it for you. You'll see that it offers an SWR of about 5.48 to 1 at 3.65 megs, 7.6 to 1 at 40 meters, then 30 meters goes up to a mass of 34 to 1. Then we go down to 4 to 1. Now, that's interesting, 4 to 1. I think that's about the lowest, uh, one of the lowest on there. The G5RV is actually designed to offer an, a low SWR on 20 meters. Everything else is kind of just a bonus. So I'm not surprised that we see a lowish SWR at 20. Then we go 70 meters, goes up to 37 to 1, 3.2 to 1 on 15, 1.88 on 10, and then 52 to 1 on 28.5. Now, has anyone ever used a G5RB on 10 meters? How did you get on matching it? Uh, well, I use an LDG tuner. <laughs> right, and you just let in. Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you, sorry, years, years ago we were doing a jammery on the air station running a G5RB uh, with the scouts. And I was having a hell of a job with a manual tuner to tune this thing on 10. It was very twitchy. And I really wasn't paying attention to the scout. So he said, it's a mystery, it's a mystery. He said, is there meant to be smoke pouring out of that box? <laughs> <laughs> and this, this kind of tells you that we're, you know, we're getting, getting a nasty reactance at, uh, and, and impedance at, at 10 meters. So from this, you, you know, we haven't had to put any aerials out. We haven't had to cut any copper. We haven't had to buy anything we can see that at least our model of the G5RV suggests that we get a reasonable match on 20. Um, not bad on 40 and, uh, and 80. 12 is a kind of a bonus, but if you want to use it on 10 metres and, and, and 18, and to a lesser, and to a lesser extent, 30 metres, you, you, you may have problems. So that's not bad for a free programme, is it? But as I said, you, when you actually build a G5RV and then you feed it with some marvellous Maplin coax or something, uh, <laughs> Um, there's no one here from Maplin, is there, by the way? That was meant to be a sarcastic comment. 
wrapped in this lovely kayak, sort of about seven fine strands of braid on it. And you, you, you carefully cut off the PVC. Oh, they're all broken. Oh, they've gone. We'll do it again. At which point you realise you should have got shot at and got some proper kayaks. Um, so when you attach your kayak to this antenna, you'll actually find that the, the actual results you get are much lower. Uh, and the more coax you put on, the better. So G5RV with a thousand foot of Maplin coax <laughs> will offer you a fantastic SWR and you'll, you'll work the world. Um, <laughs> you won't. Steve, Steve why, why did you only have it at three meters? Um, because I'd already, um, when I designed it, I'd already set it at 20 meters to start with. Um, when you can, obviously when you do the X, Y, X, y and Z coordinates, you can actually specify Z coordinate, which is the height. And I think it already put that at 20 meters. Um, you can, you can, I mean, you can do what you want. You can set it at zero um, and then add the height here, or you can actually set it at 20 meters um, in the X, Y, Z direction and then just do add zero to it. So it's two ways of doing it. I think, don't worry, it's not, it's not an antenna at three meters, but I think I'd already put it in at 20 meters to start with. Um, it's, well, it, it was best practice, uh, neither really. If you, if you put it at zero meters in the X, Y, Z geometry and then put this at zero, it wouldn't run, it would come up with an error and basically say, you, you're an idiot, you've got an antenna on the ground. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't like it, it won't do things that are on the ground. So that's the G5RV completely debunked. Um, what about the W3DZZ? This is the trap dipole, 108 foot long trap dipole with two traps. So we can add the traps into the design, into the LC um, boxes. So let's run this again. So we've, uh, we've run this. Um, the lowest point of the antenna is 10 meters high. And what we should see, and we do see, is that it works nicely on 80. We get a, a, a less than two to one SWR at 3.55 megs. We then see a two to one at 40. And then it all goes a little bit pear-shaped. Um, and you see we get six to one on 20. Then it goes low again on 15, and then eight meter, 10 meters again goes 35.6 to 1. Um, and what you can do with this is you can actually adjust the values of the capacitor and the inductor of the traps to see what combination of those two would give you the, you know, the best overall results of, for this marvelous multiband antenna. Or you could spend a whole day playing with it and realize that you can't actually set the uh, inductor and the capacitor to give it or give you every band that you want. Uh, and again, the W3ZZ was always sold as a multi-band antenna. Anyone here using a W3DZ? Do, do you get low SWRs on every band? Uh, you just use it. Yeah. Just press the auto tune button and yeah. away we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, again, this this shows you that um, a W3ZZ. Um, works well on 40, well, gives a low match, or that's a good match on 40 and 80, but may not give you a good match on some of the other bands, which is, is it's very easy to make a single band antenna, it's really hard to make a multi-band antenna. So again, we can kind of almost debunk the W3DZZ works and offers a low SWR on every band now. What about a magnetic loop? Well, as I said, we can't make circles, um, but we can make octagons. So we can make an octagon as our magnetic loop there, um, and then we can run it and see what a magnetic loop does. And we find that that's the kind of SWR, um, you know, very, very high Q antenna, very, very sharp SWR. Um, if anyone's used a magnetic loop, that's exactly what you get. Very, very sharp tuning, very, very um, small bandwidth, which is why it works as well as it does. Because with an antenna, you can have um, well, you can have efficient, you can have small, and you can have big bandwidth. Well, actually, you can have any two of those three, but you can't have all three. So the magnetic loop, it's small, yet it's quite efficient, well, reasonably, but you're not going to get the bandwidth. So if you ever see an antenna that is small, uh, it's especially high, highly efficient, and offers a massive bandwidth, it's a dummy load. Um, <laughs> so again, we can play with the magnetic loop, and we can see that um, um, you know, that's the kind of high Q tuning we get. Um, by using this, we can actually work out what, how much capacitance we need to tune the magnetic loop. So before you go off and buy very expensive capacitors, you can design your mag loop and find, right, I need a maximum 500 or 300 or whatever I need to build it. Um, then we can look at the radiation patterns, and you, uh, you find a few things. The magnetic loop, the radiation is in the plane of the loop. 
So it's not at broadside, it's actually in the plane. So you can see that uh, we've got the radiation is the plane of the loop, and we're, we're, we're shooting off, of, off the, uh, the, 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 length, the, the length of the loop, really. And then we can adjust the um, height, and you'll see what I've done is I've overlaid two plots, one, um, showing the 10 degree elevation. Um, and we can see that, uh, according to this, it's actually better at 7 metres than it is at 3. But then we look side on to the thing, and it looks the other way round. It looks like that, you know, on the, when we're looking side on to it, we're getting better elevation or better um, uh, radiation at 10 degrees when it's at th uh, 3 metres high, not 7 metres high. And you think, well, that's a bit odd, but that's the way the magnetic loop works. So it's actually working better at, that, at one height in one direction, but not so well in another. So again, you can play with this and, and tune it to what, to what you want. And people say that mag loops work at all heights. It doesn't matter. But in fact, you do get a difference in the radiation pattern at different heights. So you can see that if we put it four meters up, so another four meters up, you know, it suddenly goes very high angle, um, which you, you might not want, you know, not very useful. So again, really, really useful thing. And we can see that um, our antenna here, as we raise the height, the SWR changes slightly as well. So quite a useful tool. Now, W5GI, uh, who's heard of the mystery antenna? Hands up if you've heard of the mystery antenna. It's the most stupidly named thing in the world because once you call it the mystery antenna, nobody's going to take it seriously. It was actually designed by W5GI. Uh, it's about, it's kind of like a G5RV but uses these shorted stubs and is a multi-band antenna or meant to be. We use them a lot in our local club. We kind of had it as a club project. Um, and we find it works really well on 40 and 80 and, and works okay on 20, is less so the further you go up. But it's, it's, a, it's a cheap and easy alternative to a G5 RV that works you know, very well on 1480. We use, we use one of these things on special event stations. We can sit there all day working. I mean, I see Malcolm's over there. We, we work hundreds of DLs on 1480 with one of these all day, can't we, for, for very little money. But what you find is that, again, with, with any antenna that's longer than a half wavelength, um, it can break up into a multi low pattern on the higher band. So this is the pattern you get on 10 meters. So we've got this nice cloverleaf pattern from this antenna. So we've got a nice lobe at about, uh, what's that, about 11, uh, 11 degrees there. And you've got a null, and again and again. And, you know, we've got very, very deep nulls here. Um, that nulls that are almost, well, about 25 dB nulls off the side. And you may find this with multiband antennas, that in some directions they work incredibly well. In others, you just can't hear anything. Um, and this is why. So this is, a, as a flat top antenna, horizontal at probably about 10 meters or 20, yeah, 15 meters. Um, and you'd probably try and be thinking, well, is that a good antenna or not? Well, it depends where the lobes go. If the lobes uh, you know, end up on, on South America here and uh, Africa here and uh, off towards Australia in this direction, you'd think it's marvelous. If that ended up in the, in the North Sea and the Caribbean, uh, uh, yeah, Caribbean, and, and in fact, you miss America completely, you'd probably say it's an awful antenna. Which, go some way to explaining why some people rave about some antennas and some people don't. And it, it can come down to, you know, all the areas that you wish to work on the lobe or not. And again, we haven't had to cut any copper whatsoever. Um, and again, we can play with the antenna design and say, well, okay, what if we turn it into an inverted V? Um, so we'll, we'll bring the ends down. And what you see is that this lobe pattern starts to flatten out and you get less gain um, in these maximum directions now, but some of the, some of the, uh, the nulls are starting to fill in. And it, it starts to become a little bit more omnidirectional. Which, and if you, if you play with inverted V designs with this program, you see this, that um, turning something into an inverted V will kind of benefit you in some directions because it will fill in the lobes, or the nulls, beg your pardon, but the lobes will actually start to contract a little bit. So inverted V is a, is a reasonable way of actually trying to get more of an omnidirectional antenna, but you do lose gain in some directions. Now, this, this is a great antenna. It's called the Microvert. Anybody heard of this one? No? It's about four foot long, and then it has a quarter wave of coax here, uh, that is only, I've got to remember how this works now. Yeah, it's only connected to the to the uh, inner, so it's actually using the quarter wave coax as the um, other half of the antenna. So it's kind of like a dipole, but the, the the other half of the dipole is is the coax. So it's a tiny, tiny antenna. So the question is, does the coax do the radiation? 
Well, if we get we we now model it, we can see here that you probably can't see this about this little thing here is actually the radiation from the antenna, and this is the um, this is the current that's flowing on the radial. So yeah, uh, the coax is doing a lot of the radiation. And to be fair to the designer, uh, he, he admit this is what he's trying to do. But it's a way of getting an HF antenna into a very very small place. But to, to say that the the antenna is doing most of the radiating when all the current is in this um, piece of coax here, I think is a, is a little bit um, suspect. Um, another quick question. When I first moved into the, my current house, um, in the, kind of the first week, I wanted to get out of the air and do something, so I threw up a W3 EDP end fed, so it's 85 feet of wire, goes out of my shack window, up over the roof and down the garden with a counterpoise. And I found I could work really, really well to the south, east, south, west, but couldn't work terribly well any other direction. And America, which of course is to the north, uh, west, uh, was pretty dire. But if you model it, then you get this um, kind of pattern. So this is to the northwest, this is the south, east, that's the southwest. And then we've got this big null here, it looks like a, um, somebody's. Uh, no, I won't say. Um, someone's bum cheek, bum cheek, so looks like it's a bit more rude. And we've got a big null around us in this direction. So again, if you were, if you were putting this kind of antenna up, um, and this null was in the direction of the states, and you wanted to work with the states, you would curse this antenna, where if you could rotate, you know, orientate it differently, so that um, the states was on one of these lobes, then it might work for you. So we can play with this very quickly. You'll see that, of course, it's, it's quite a high, ang high angle, uh, antenna, but it's not a, a DXC antenna. Um, but this is a DX antenna. This is the end fed half wave, um, but written about uh, extensively. So we take a piece of wire, it's half a wavelength long. Um, unfortunately, by doing that, the impedance at the end of them very, very high, somewhere in the region of two to 3,000 ohms. So you have to have a matching network um, that will actually match it, quite easy to make. But now we get this um, very kind of low angle um, pattern here. So we see we're getting maximum radiation there at about 20 degrees. And it, and it works very effectively. And as uh, my friend Roger LDI, G3 LDI, would say, it radiates equally poorly in all directions. Um, but um, so we, you can play with this and you can, you can raise it up and down and see what happens to the pattern um, as well. And uh, as you say, if you had. If you had and we get this a lot in our club, we, we, some of the, the newcomers come along, put up an 80 meter vertical and say it's useless because they're trying to work around the UK where they want a high lobe, you know, Envis, uh, near vertical instance radiation um, uh, lobe. So if you had this as a vertical for 80 meters, you'll see that there's nothing here at all. If you're trying to work around the UK on that other than ground wave, you, you'd really struggle. And so again, you can, you can actually use this as, as an explanation of why things work and why things don't. Um, okay, 80 meter offsets off center fed dipole, the, the famous Wyndham or Carolina Wyndham. Uh, technically, it's an off center fed dipole, it's not a Wyndham. But we, you know, we can, we can create one and we can then try as an inverted V in the flat top and see what happens. And what you find is that um, you get your classic low SWR there at uh, 80 meters, you get the other one at 40, uh, it's at 30 meters there. Uh, about 20 meters there, but if we turn it into an inverted V, which is a red um, plot, you suddenly find that you start to change the whole way the thing works, and we're suddenly we've lost we've lost the low SWR there that was at 30. <laughs> uh, this has shifted up a little bit. Again, we've lost the 50 meter um, low there. It's it's, got, it's gone high, um, but now suddenly we've got a low here at. Uh, about 26 megahertz, which for radio hands is, is pretty useless. So again, you can model this whole thing. People don't often realize that changing something from a flat top to an inverted V or, or changing the, the, the way that the, the antenna is orientated has a massive um, difference or makes a massive difference to, to its performance <laughs> and where the, uh, the lowest SWR points are. And that explains it quite well. Which again, you know, you buy the antenna, you put it up as inverted V, and then you, you bring the manufacturer and say, well, this is useless. It, you said it would have a low SWR on, th on 30 meters, and it doesn't. Um, and you can use it to optimize antennas and play with ideas. This is a 40 meter off center fed dipole. 
Uh, again, what we would class, uh, commonly call the, the window, but a 40 metre off centre fed, fed dipole. And the conventional wisdom is that you feed it at the one third, two thirds feed point. What happens if you feed it somewhere else? Well, if we feed it, let's, let's just stick with the one third um, feed point. You see, we get a low SWR at 40 metres, we get one at 20, and then we get one at 10 metres up here. But if we actually feed it in a different place, if we actually move the feed point along to 41.1%, you still get the 80, you still get the 40, but lo and behold, we get 15 meters as well. So by, with an offset effect dipole, by changing the feed point, you can actually uh, alter its characteristics and actually Im improve it and, and bring in other bands. Again, this is theoretical. Um, this is, is thinking that you're actually building out of copper wire, not PVC coated wire, which you've got to adjust and make sure as a result. And it assumes that you haven't got any trees, greenhouses, um, you know, neighbours' cars, or anything else. But the principle is, is is there, and you can you can actually play with this and then test it to see if it works. I built one for our club like yeah. that with the with the forty one percent. Did it work? So it worked very well. We oh. Put uh, on. one of those uh, little. Um, uh, VNAs on it yeah. and looked across the whole thing and it, we had some pretty good results yeah. right through every band. Yeah, And what you can also do with this is you can test it for different balance. So you can change the feed body pins to 300 ohms yeah. with a 6 to 1 balance um, and see how it, uh, how it works. So I'm glad you said it worked. So yeah. that, that kind of proves that the model is, yeah, is doing... It's better than standard one third, two third. Yeah. Much better. Yeah, I think so. But I think from memory, if you actually turn this into an inverted V, yeah, if you turn this inverted, it all goes yeah. pear shaped and you have to start again. So, again, you could model this, think fine, put it up to the inverted V, and then find it doesn't work properly. Yeah, with a, with a 4 to 1 at the feed point. 4 to 1 at the feed point. So, pitfalls, things to consider with Imar um, Nagal, MMA and A. The software assumes your antenna has nothing around it, okay? It, it's not that bright, it doesn't know about your house, car, greenhouse, uh, and everything else. And do you know about what your earth conductivity and dielectric constant is? I, I, yes, I do. You do? No. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we, I, I, I don't know. I've got a clue. And I was talking earlier saying you can check your conductivity. I've read a book in America where it said stick to a couple of points down, apply 110 volts between, and measure the cut. Oh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, so you, there are a number of set uh, values in here that you can use, or you can change it to others. And you, the, the, important, the funny thing with this is you can actually change it to seawater, which has got a uh, conductivity of about 5,000 compared with about 10, I think, for, for, for Earth. Um, and you can see why verticals work so well when they're on the beach. Uh, likewise, you can put a dipole up next to a beach and see what it does, and you'll find it makes very little difference, which is why the verticals work so well on the beach. Um, make sure you choose the right uh, impedance. Sometimes it can default to 75 ohm, you want 50 perhaps. Make sure you're actually setting the elevation you want to test, so you, if you're looking for its low angle uh, elevation, make sure you're looking at that. So the inverted Vs, you need to use Pythagoras to work out the lengths of the wire, or you go to the wire edit pro, um, page and add in bits and pieces. Um, if you use PVC coated wire, everything will actually be a lot shorter than you actually um, predicted. Um, Part of this is due to end effects, part due to um, velocity factor. In the book, I think I said that um, the late Reg, I can't remember who's the call sign man, uh, the guy who did all the computer programs that are still available, uh, he argued with me and said that um, PVC coded wire will have no effect on the velocity factor whatsoever, or very small. But the, the, the reality is that if you actually model something in a Marmot Gallery and then make it with PVC coded wire, you will find, whether you like it or not, that things are shorter than it calculates. Now, whether that's end effect or velocity factor, I'm not sure. I said real life SWR values will be better than predicted due to coax losses, absolutely. Uh, and that is real life. If you, if you ever test the um, SWR of an antenna at its feed point and then add 100 foot of coax, it will be lower due to losses. And one final thing is you're supposed to apply your feed point, your source, to a straight piece of wire, not to an angled joint. So if you've got an inverted V, you have to put a tiny little bit of straight wire in um, to do it. The, the instructions recommend you do that. In reality, you may find that it makes no difference, but I, I'm just telling you what the instructions say. As I said, it's a simulation. Real life ins installations may not behave that way. Um, sources of information. Um, the Imanagal software, just Google it, 
and you'll find it at that uh, particular uh, page. I checked it recently to see whether they'd upgraded it recently, and it's, it's not. It's still the, the, the version we've been using for some time. Uh, as I said, it uses the NEC2 engine, not the NEC4. NEC, the NEC4 one, if you want to buy a professional program using NEC4, it costs an awful lot of money. There's various tutorials um, online that you can actually look at to help you. Um, and the, on YouTube, there's a lot of tutorials on there as well. This presentation today is at g0kya.blogspot.com. Just Google g0kya and search for Emana Gal and you'll, you'll find it somewhere. It's been in there a couple of years now. Um, overall, I think it's a, a, an excellent program. It's free. You can do an awful lot with it in terms of what if I did this, what if I did that. Is it as good as it, or is it anywhere near as good as EasyNeck? I don't know, because I don't use EasyNeck, to be honest. And when I have looked at EasyNeck, it uses a different way of putting things together. I've kind of got used to this now. Um, I'm not knocking EasyNeck, and it's an excellent program. Um, but you've got to pay for it, I think. There's a demo version available, but uh, this one is completely free and will, will remain so. I think that might be the last slide it is. So I'll just leave that screen up. At um, which point we've got um, whoa, three or four minutes for questions, I think. So, oh, look, hands straight up. The guy at the back, then, sir. Right. I've got this program. Yes. I'm play the back. Right. I'm going to can't see figure out. If you've got an inversion V. Yes. Two things I'm sure. Yes. One is, I want to make the V like that. So the V comes down, and I want to have two horizontal elements across. Yes. Right, Second thing is, the height of the ends of the V compared to the source height. I don't guess it. What? what? Right, you got an inverted V, yeah. that's how it's where you square your character's feet in. Yeah. That'll be 30 degrees. Yes. The height of the ends. Yes. Where do you change that? Well, that would be in the um, Z direction for that, those particular wires. So I would, I would start off with those, saying put those two wires in at a Z height of 3 metres or whatever it is that you want. <laughs> And then use Pythagoras to work out where your feed point should be. Does that make sense? No. No. Okay. Uh, I can't think of another way of putting it, really. <coughs> let, let, let's say I'm feeding the, the game along my Yeah. So it's roughly 30 feet high. Yeah. They're putting down the end of the dial, down the end of the dial. Right. <coughs> but that's a then straight Well, set, set the Z height of your feed point at 3 meters, uh, sorry, 10 meters. Yeah. Then have the ends come down to 3 meters. And then the wires that you've got coming off that would have a Z height of three meters as well. So everything should then join up with each other. Could you draw it on that graph page you showed? Uh, you, you, well, yes, you could draw it on that graph page. Yeah, you could do it. But I, I, I mean, I would use Pythagoras and, and do it. Uh, and then you could just check the 3D model. I, I don't quite see what the, the problem is. If we, well, sorry, I asked you two separate questions. Take away the Right. Just the right. The height of the ends yes. off the floor. Yeah. How high do you want them to be off the floor? Well, they're about three metres. Right. Set the Z height of the ends at three metres. Okay, so the Z, the height of that the ends are at three metres. The Z height is at three metres. Then calculate what your new Z height needs to be for the apex using Pythagoras. Yeah, but that, that, that's the bit that I couldn't find. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm working, I'm working like yeah. 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 I just couldn't find where to put two separate figures. Oh, I see in the screen. All oh, right. Hang on. I think we're getting somewhere. Uh, okay. Well, here you. This the. Okay. Let's just say that this is one of the legs of your inverted V. You'd have the Z Z one at three meters and the Z two at ten meters, whatever the height is. So you can actually change it. So now we've got a diagonal wire that's going from 3 metres to 10. And then if we want these end bits that you were talking about, then we set the Z height of that to 3 and the Z2 height to 3 as well. So that we've actually got a horizontal piece of wire now. Yeah, um, you only need one line for one wire. So your inverter V, um, you need two wires for that. And then the pieces that are going to come off the ends would be another two wires. So it's a total of four, four wires. In fact, I would make it five. Yeah, five and a little little tiny piece of the feed point. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll carry on playing. All right. Come see me afterwards. Gentleman here. So you mentioned that um, this program, or this version of the program, doesn't cope very well or at all with carrying radials. What can we do with it in respect to modeling words for that purpose? Good question. Um, you can put radials down in it. <coughs> 
um, and you put them just slightly above the ground, about 0.1 of a centimetre above the ground. If you put them at zero, it will, it will come up with an error. So you can actually add radials to it, but you have to put them at about 0.1 centimetre or whatever. I'm not totally convinced that um, if you keep adding more and more radials, whether you actually see the SWR change as the impedance starts to move towards 35 ohms or what. It's a guide, but it's not going to tell you how much better it's going to be by putting 120 radials in, I don't think, compared with, say, four. Um, but that's how you do it. You put the radials in, absolutely, but you, you elevate everything just, just off the ground at so, that point. So one. give you an indication of how the feed point impedance changes from changing, say, inverted L. Yeah, like yeah. That. yeah, it will manage that one as well. And what you find with a, a quarter wave uh, vertical with a really, really good ground plane under it is that the impedance tends towards 35 ohms. Not, I mean, this is the classic, classic with um, something like Butterna or Hustler. As you stick a, a ground post in, I've said this many times, you put your thing in, you measure the SWR and it's one to one, and you're fantastic, sorted. Now you start adding the radials, you know, there's something wrong here because the SWR is going up. That's correct, that's what it should do. It should end up at about 1.5 to 1. Next question, so we're running out of time and people need to go somewhere else. Here we go. Uh, do you, d does the program allow for uh, different examples, like uh, three element beams, uh, cubical quad? In, in, so you can click on and see what's been done before. What you can do is you create your model, yeah. you can save the radiation patterns, yeah. and then you can bring, import those and compare them with your the next okay. test antenna yeah. and see how it compares. Yeah. So yes, you can. Like in SNET, so yeah. you, can, you can click on to, what, within the program, a backyard dipole, for example. And it'll bring up all that, all those figures from the backyard. You can't, you can't do that naturally, yeah. but you can create a dime oh, yeah. save yeah. the far field information, then import and compare. Yeah. But it's just that for beginners, it's yeah. very easy to have, yeah. if you like, all the geometry on that page there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A dive pop. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. if you have to generate it, it's a little bit more difficult yeah. to start. So I use it. I've got tons and tons and tons of models, and I just call yeah. it the one I want, save the format, yeah. and, and away we go. Okay. And, oh, gentlemen at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'll work, it'll work below two megs. Um, no, I've not. I mean, it, it could be the number of segments. Um, but I, I've used it at top band and it seems to work fine. explain that, other than it, there's not enough segments to do the job, but I wouldn't have thought so if you have a simple antenna on top band. Not noticed it. It may, it may be there's something wrong in your model. Um, yeah, don't know, don't know. Jeff, that's Paul, yeah. I just, uh, I missed the beginning. Isn't it available just for Windows? Um, I've tried running it on a Mac with a, an emulator, I don't think I got on terribly well. I don't think it's available for Linux, just, just uh, Windows. But it will run on 9, XP um, 7, 10, I think it will run on 10 as well. So it's not bad. Any more questions? So Sir? can it be used for multiple antennas where you feed in each antenna with a different phase? <sighs> um, yes and no. What you can do is you can create multiple antennas in there and you yeah. can apply different sources to each of them, yeah. but that then assumes they're all in phase. You then, if you want them out of phase, and you've actually got to apply some sort of phasing lines to them, and that yeah. gets complicated because you've then got to model the phasing lines. It can't do coax, so you, you can model 300 ohm or 450 ohm phasing lines. My word, it gets complicated. Um, and you might be better off just building the damn thing and see how it works. Sorry? Yes, oh, can you? I've never done that. Right. Can you? Oh look, yes you can. I beg your pardon. Look, you could create you could create two antennas, put a different source on each one, and change yeah. the phase. I've never done it. You can do well that. Then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll try. Excellent. <laughs> right, I need to update the book now. Didn't make it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any more? If not, we'll uh, we'll call it quits. I've never used that kind of software. Very wise. I've got a very small garden. I could wire antennas up, I've got a bag of bags here, there, and everywhere. Yeah. Is that just having more wires or something from there? Or? 
Yeah, you can, I mean, like the, the, you saw the W3DP that goes over the house. That's just a, a succession of, of uh, wires connected together. So yeah, you can, you can model that. You could model your own design. It gets a bit complicated. Of course, again, you, you either got to go to the, the, the wire edit program or start working out Pythagoras to get everything in, in the right place. And so if you get it wrong, so things don't connect up, it will throw an error. So, and they sit scratching and trying to work out which line is wrong. So save regularly, I would say. You know, that when you're creating something, save it on a regular basis and then make sure it's all working. Uh, any more before we uh, call it quits? Gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, when you enter these figures, make sure you hit the enter, or sort of yeah. the to... Yeah, that's true actually, you put the numbers in, you hit enter. So you put the numbers in and then just, just click off it, they will vanish, and you'll curse yourself. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Hit enter Yeah. And I think that the point about the phase, that's fantastic, never realised that. So yes, you could, you could create uh, four squares, you could create stacked uh, yardies and then apply different phases to them. And the, oh, it has got other little tools I didn't mention that will actually help you uh, build the coils, uh, work out the values for your traps. Um, it will ha actually work out how you could, what stubs or whatever you need to match things. A very powerful program for nothing, really. All right, well, I'm going to be clearing up. So if anyone wants to have a chat while I do that, fine. If not, uh, have fun with the next uh, lecture. What area do I need to use? These are like yeah. constraints. Yeah. Well, you can also tell it, I, I want to build something, this is what I want, and I want the, what will give me the lowest SWR or the maximum gain. Um, I say something about that in the book, because we were trying to work out what could you put um, reflectors under an 80 meter dipole to maximize the end of its gain. And it, it clunked away and it came up with something, and yeah, there you go, maximum gain, but the SWR was about 3,000 to 1 or something, so you'd need to have a match, matching network. So, yeah, it's, it's powerful. No, powerful, it'd be, powerful it'd, it would be great if it didn't work the other way around in some ways, because I think with a lot of beginners, trying to actually yeah. optimize their rustic yeah. situation. And I suppose really, you know, just come back yeah. the basic principles that you just put a dive on. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much. Saying, I've, I've got, I think in the program there's, a, there's an inverted V, mm -hmm. which I've got at the moment, there's no problem. And I thought, right, hang on, I need the top band.